page 37 continued question number 39 what is your idea of a tragic hero can edward ii be considered as a tragic hero answer according to aristotle a tragic hero is neither preeminently virtuous or just nor preeminently vicious or wicked one open quotes in the enjoyment of great reputation and prosperity close quotes he is to be a great man he is to be a great man with yet a flaw in character his misfortune is the result not of vice or depravity but of open quotes some error or judgment close quotes open quotes hamartia h a m a r t i a close quotes in aristotle's language shakespeare however has made a criminal like macbeth a tragic hero with superb art shakespeare has shown that the character of macbeth is that of an honorable man while his career is that of a criminal while he strides from mother to mother the spectators are granted a vision of his lacerated heart which bleeds for the loss of his troops friends friends and honor he secures sympathy even in his downfall this is the crux of the problem a tragic hero retains the sympathy and admiration of the audience from the beginning to the end he is a great man not only in his power and position but because he exhibits ordinary qualities in an extraordinary combination of shakespeare's tragic heroes bradley says that open quotes they are made of the stuff we find within ourselves and within the persons who surround them but by an intensification of the life which they share with others they are raised above them close quotes it is the task of the dramatist to build up sympathy for the hero at the beginning and to keep it all keep it up all through so that we not only pity him in his fall but also we have a feeling of waste in his undeserved misfortune there must be a sense in a great tragedy that the misfortune of the hero is undeserved the hero's tragedy is not due to his folly or crime although he is also responsible for it his sufferings and misfortune are disproportionate to his folly or crime if there is any folly and crime the cases of macbeth and richard are different there shakespeare exhibits the crime and the poetic ability of the hero to see what is happening to him his folly or error is not fatal by itself it is fatal for the circumstances in which he is placed there is the insist there is the insistent impression that his tragic deed is uncharacteristic of his character there is an inner havoc on his soul which leads him to the deed that causes his tragic sufferings the particular tragic moment creates a spiritual disintegration in the hero he becomes completely absorbed in the problem he fights his own mind oscillates between extremes and in his pro- process suffer poignant agony what impresses the audience is their heroic resistance against the tragic deed page 38 abercrombie a b e r c r o m b i e abercrombie rightly observes that open quotes there is no tragedy where there is no resistance close quotes the tragic hero derives his greatness of spirit from the titanic contest of impulses impulse to be good and impulse sorry impulse to good and impulse to evil because of this conflict the hero secures sympathy for his action 
and leaves the audience with a sense of admiration for the heroic grandeur which he shows in the contest. The hero is defeated in the natural plane, but he has the ultimate triumph in the spiritual plane. In this way, tragedy secures the equivalence of feelings, gladness and grief blending in a harmony. This is from Myris, M-Y-R-E-S, from his book Tragic View of Life. He realizes his folly or crime and attains a kind of moral or spiritual recovery. Thus, a tragic hero receives pity, sympathy and admiration from the audience. Malu broke with the whole medieval conception of tragedy in which it was the fall of a great man brought about by fate. With him, as later with Shakespeare, tragedy is distress resulting from some overweening feature of weakness, weakness or strength in, in the character. In Tambulane, it is lust for power. In Dr. Faustus, it is, a, it is a lust for sovereign knowledge. For the Middle Ages, tragedy was a thing of princes. For Malo, it was a thing of individual heroes. The medieval conception of the royalty of tragedy is supplanted by, by the Renaissance ideal of individual worth. Edward II, though he is a king, suffers and dies because of the fact that he is weak, impetuous and self-indulgent as a person. Generally, Marlowe's heroes like Tamberlin and Dr. Faustus are men of the highest aspiration and come to grief not because they set themselves against the moral laws but because of the exhaustion of the vital energy in the natural course of life. Nicole observes, open quotes, The medieval conception of tragedy was a distinctly moral one. Drama had to show this falling into adversity and thereby inculcate a moral lesson. There is no moral of this sort in Marlowe's plays. The interest, the interest centers wholly on the personality of the hero and the pleasure derived from the drama comes from watching that personality, comes from the sense of greatness which that personality brings with it. Close quotes. Indeed, Marlowe has shown the glory and power in the tragic catastrophes of Tamburlaine and Dr. Faustus. The defeat of their aspirations is spelt out in poignant tragedy, which produces the feelings of pity and admiration for the heroes. The sense of glory and dignity is kept up in the death and defeat of the heroes. Both fate and character contribute to the tragedy of the heroes. But Edward II is built on a different method altogether. He is a historical character and the requirements of history impose restrictions on the dramatist. Yet, the character is presented in such a way as to underscore the irony of kingship. At the beginning, our sympathy for the hero is alienated. Is alienated. His weakness, his vacillation, his irresponsibility are brought into prominence. He cannot command the respect of the barons and gives himself to vain boastings and important rage and helpless complaints. He says, quote, But what are kings when regiment is gone? But perfect shadows in a sunshine day. My nobles rule. I bear the name of king. I wear the crown, but am controlled by them. Close quotes. Act 5, Scene 1, Lines 24 to 27. He only imitates the haughty manner of a powerful king. His infatuation for his favorites and his cruelty of his wife forfeit our sympathy for him. His love for his favorites is genuine and sincere, but it has nothing glorious or heroic in it. In short, Edward's frivolity and irresponsibility, which are emphasized in the early part of the drama, do not make him a hero in the true sense of the word. 
Marlowe seems to be preoccupied with the task of exposing the falsity of Edward's conception of sovereignty. He is a king and therefore must be respected and feared. Page 39 Towards the end of the drama, our sympathy is roused for the unhappy king. In the Abbey of Neath, the king is resigned to his lot and his mood is drowsy and hopeless. In Kenilworth Castle, where the king is forced to give up his crown, Edward gives himself up to despairing self-pity. The pitiful agony of the king struggling with, open quotes, the reluctant pangs of abdicating royalty, close quotes, is delineated poignantly. Quote, All times and seasons rest you at a stay that Edward may still be fair England's king. Close quotes. From Act 5, Scene 1, Lines 67-68. The king is subjected to indignity and humiliation. He stands in, quote, mire and puddle. Close quotes, and is shaved in ditch water. When Lightborn enters, he sees quote, mother close quotes, in his eyes. He is seized with prognostication. Quote, Something still buzzeth in mine ears and tells me if I sleep I never wake. This fear is that which makes me tremble thus. Act 5, Scene 5, 102 to 105. Malu brings out the pathos of Edward's fall. Edward's heart-rending cry in despair and disgrace produces nothing but pity for the unhappy king. Quote, now, sweet God of heaven, make me despise this transitory pomp and sit for I enthronized in heaven. Come death. And with thy fingers close my eyes, for if I live, let me forget myself. Act 5, Scene 1, Lines 107-11 to This is the pathetic cry of a weak man. It only evokes pity for the hero. His defeat and death do not arouse that sense of grandeur which underlies the sorriness of the hero's fate. There is the feeling that the hero's fall is justified, that his misfortune is deserved. So the tragedy of Edward II fails to move the readers with that terror and pity which are the principal tragic emotions. It, at the same time, does not awaken that sense of glory about the hero whose greatness of spirit is revealed in his contest with necessity in a great tragedy. In short, Edward II does not reach the summit of tragic art. Question 40 Sketch the character of young Mortimer. Show that he is a typical Marlovian hero. Answer Young Mortimer is the leader of the baronical party and the fiercest critic of the, hero, of the king's attachment to his favourites. He can tolerate the wanton humour of the king, but he cannot stand the pertness of Gaviston. He would, quote, hail him from the bosom of the king and at the court gate hang the peasant up, close quotes. He is equally fierce against the second favourite of the king, Spencer Jr. In the battlefield of Borobridge, he asks the king to banish the pernicious company, he feels for the neglected king sorry he feels for the neglected queen champions her cause and voices the complaint of the barons Quote, the idle triumphs makes lascivious shows and prodigal gifts based on gaviston have drawn thy treasury dry and made thee weak close quotes mortimer is a typical hero of marlowe there is the same note of lawless ambition as in Tamburlaine. He is impulsive and reckless. When Gaveston returns after his exile, he irritates the nobles by his insolence. Mortimer stabs him in the presence of the king. 
When the barons are defeated, Edward Sorry, when the barons have defeat when the barons defeated Edward and he sent to the page 40 tower he still remains haughty open quotes can ragged stony walls immure the virtue that aspires to heaven close quotes this arrogant aspiration aligns him to the marlovian heroes like tamburlaine and dr faustus who fall owing to their lawlessly aspiring ambition mortimer escapes from the tower crosses over to france and joins the queen with the vaulting ambition to lord it over the queen and the kingdom to lord it over the queen and the kingdom he is thus endowed with boundless aspiration and reckless defiance of all impediments like other heroes of malu from this moment his machiavellian nature becomes prominent he is not only puffed up with the ambition of becoming the real ruler but also he is in guilty love with the queen he becomes normally degraded along with his rise to power and domination moreover he gloats over his success as a villain he is covetous of the supreme authority of the state ambition makes him repulsive in the end intrigue crime and craft he uses to satisfy his ambition he imprisons edward becomes the protector of the prince shamelessly he boasts of his power open quotes the prince i rule the queen do i command close quotes ultimately he murders the king in order to be safe in his position Cl- open quotes as for myself i stand as jove's huge tree close quotes but the new king instantly orders his death like other marlovian heroes he is haughty even in his death he curses fortune scorns the world and maintains a philosophic indifference to death he has touched the highest point of ambition does not grieve at his fall he desires to go as a traveler to discover countries yet unknown malo makes mortimer an embod- embodiment of the renaissance spirit of his age the great elizabethan age of voyage of discovery and geographical explorations question 41 show by an analysis of the character of mortimer quote that mortimer is remarkably akin to malo's earlier heroes close quotes answer c answer to question number 40 from the second paragraph question 42 open quotes Mortimer develops towards the end of the play into something like a Machiav- Machiavellian villain. Close quotes. Discuss the statement. Answer. See answer to question 40, second and third paragraphs only. Add. Machiavelli was an Italian statesman who made courage and cunning the two principles of statesmanship. unscrupulousness and intrigue are the very basis of machiavellian politics even murder in the interest of the state was justified by machiavelli the younger mortimer becomes machiavellian his early impetuousness turning to cold deliberation isabella first teaches him to scheme to use machiavelli's formula of necessity of necessity within courts from act 1 scene 4 lines 238 and to sacrifice integrity to expediency immediately after his whispered colloquy with the queen mortimer comes forward to the other earls a changed man once gaveston is recalled to england he suggests How easily might some base slave be suborned 
to greet his lordship with a poniard from act 1 scene 4 lines 265 66 it is no accident that mortimer's coat base slave uncoat is to use the treacherous poniard by the time they return to england act 4 scene 4 Mortimer is master over the queen a perfunctory formality graces his remarks to her but beneath this is a determined mind quick to suspect and ready to act without scruple Kent's uneasy questioning of Isabella's intentions towards Edward alerts Mortimer quote I like not this relenting mood in Edmund madam tis good to look to him betimes Unquote. from act 4 scene 5 lines 47 48 page 41 his reverence to the queen is now fitful his power over her and the realm is finally established isabella now dotes on mortimer he is not the pure machiavellian acting for the good of the state but a stage parody motivated by self interest he is corrupted by power and success he resorts to hypocrisy and dissembling to kent <coughs> to kent he pretends <coughs> to kent he pretends that he has no hand in the matter of disposing of edward quote this not is her controlment not in ours but as the realm and parliament shall please so shall your brother be disposed of unquote scene 4 sorry act 4 scene 5 lines 43 46 on his assuming the protectorship he is full of self congratulations quote they trust upon me the protectorship and sue to me for that that i desire unquote act 5 scene 4 lines 56 58 he indulges in boasting of his power quote as for myself i stand as love's huge tree and others are but shrubs compared to me unquote act 5 scene 6 lines 11 to 12 he does not hesitate to resort to mothers for his own self interest He has ordered the execution of Kent, got his agent, the vicious Lightborn, murdered by his henchmen after the murder of Edward is done. But, quote, false Gourney has betrayed him, unquote. He fully deserves the traitor's death. Bold and reckless in his life of ambition, he is equally haughty in his death. Quote, farewell, fair queen. Weep not for Mortimer that scorns the world and as a traveler goes to discover countries yet unknown Act 5 scene 6 lines 64 66 Question 43 Analyze the character of the younger Mortimer is there any abrupt change in his development is it true to history or sketch the character of mortimer in edward ii is there any inconsistency in its development answer answer c answer to question 40 and 42 add mortimer's development for an insolent leader of the barons to a machiavellian villain is abrupt lees observes L W E S Lees observes quote we wonder whether this egregious e g r e g i o u s egregious villain can be the same man within the apparent time limits of the play he obviously cannot be but marlow has really pre- represented the degeneration of 23 years and allowing for a little exaggeration at the end we have to admit it as a melancholy possibility unquote. but his anger his outspokenness 
his impetuosity and impatience are sufficient hints for his role as an agent to bring about the fall of edward quote let us leave the brain sick king and henceforth parley with our naked swords unquote he gets a testimonial from edward quote the people love him well unquote his leadership is ensured marlow's treatment of the two mortimers is unhistorical in hollinshed both mortimers seem to have first taken sides against the king in 1330 when they and others wished to buy certain lands in the morches m o r c a t s the younger mortimer rises into prominence only after the queen has landed in england with an army from france mortimer had a minor part in the insurrection again his development as a machiavellian villain is marlow's invention as regards his relationship with isabella marlow develops a current scandal repeated by hollinshade for as some write she was found to be with child by him unquote. the younger mortimer joined forces with her in france but their only known attachment was this public one and their only passion in brackets it seemed a lust for power thus young mortimer as is depicted by marlow is almost an original creation page 42 however his development as an ambitious and unscrupulous politician is not as jarring as the development of isabella from a devoted wife to mortimer's paramour question 44 quote in the character of the queen alone i miss any indication of the transition from her faithful but despairing attachment to the king to a guilty love for mortimer quote unquote discuss answer this remark by a c ward w a r d ward points to the inconsistency in the characterization of isabella it is pointed out that at the beginning of the play isabella is a miserable woman pathetically devoted to her husband and pines for his love page 42 edward cruelly treats her and throws her out as a french strumpet it is her mournful complaint about the neglect of her lord that moves the gallant mortimer who asks quote to cry quittance and not to cry sorry and not to love him any more unquote she replies i love him more than he can gaveston act 1 scene 4 lines 301 to 2 at the behest of the king she persuades the barons with a piteous appeal to agree to the recall of gaveston She does this to win the favor of her husband. She is here a distressed woman, loyally devoted to her husband. Her retaliation, sorry, her relation with Mortimer is no more than that between a woman in distress and a gallant sympathizer. In Tinnemouth Castle, Isabella is rudely deserted by her husband, who flies for safety from the invading barons. A few minutes after her lamentation comes from the queen a soliloquy. which indicates her resolve to go over to mortimer quote so well hast thou deserved sweet mortimer as isabella could live with thee forever in vain i look for love at edward's hand act 2 scene 4 lines 59 to 61 it is suggested that for this development sufficient indications have not been furnished after her landing in england from france we hear from kent that mortimer and isabel do kiss that is within quotes subsequently she dissembles artfully surrenders completely to mortimer consents to the murder of her husband and is an apt accomplice in every crime perpetrated by mortimer this change is sudden it is a blatant artistic flaw one critic tries to justify this change 
on the ground of dramatic necessity. Quote, the change in Mortimer's character and Isabella's is to add pity and terror to Edward's end, to assist in the swing from destitution and contempt of Edward's when abusing his power to pity for Edward when he has fallen from high estate. Unquote. F. P. Wilson defends the characterization. The volt face is prepared for and is completely credible. One sees the process whereby the queen's fidelity is worn down, strained beyond endurance. Edward is peevish, unjustly suspicious, deceitful and insulting, where Mortimer is gallant and affectionate. Her weariness is revealed in the words, quote, These hands are tied with healing of my lord from Gavistone, unquote. It is clear when she says, quote, Yet once more I'll importune him with prayers, unquote. In France, she concludes that nothing can be hoped for from her marriage. Quote, we are too far, unquote. She comes more and more to depend on Mortimer, and with him she degenerates. Weakness has become evil in her half-ashamed admission that she would welcome Edward's death. Quote, I would he were dead, so it were not by my means. Unquote. J. B. Steen, S. T. E. A. N. E. Steen, observes, quote, She is a poor, sad woman, having just about as much loyalty and feeling as most people have, yet required to bear, yet required to bear more than a non-heroic nature can endure. The strain and the development are only sketched, but the sketching is realistic and done with insight. Unquote. Page 43 Continuation of Answer to Question 44 Moreover, it is suggested that Marlowe gives hints to indicate the development of an intimate relationship between the two. Malu makes everyone keep before the Queen and the idea that she is in love with Mortimer. Gaveston says this openly, quote, On Mortimer, with whom ungently Queen, unquote. The King believes it, quote, Yes, yes, for Mortimer, your lover's sake, unquote. The courtiers glance and whisper. Moreover, Marlow develops from the conduct of the Queen, a subplot essential to the main plot. 